It was a soggy December morning in 2022 as I conducted my battle walk near the quaint village of Chaumont, Belgium. Having visited thousands of war monuments from the haunted fields of Gettysburg to the storm-battered cliffs of Pont du Hoc and the blood-soaked earth of Hill 112, none have whispered to me quite like the beech tree of Chaumont. This isn't just any tree. It marks the start of what proved to be the near annihilation of Combat Command B of the 4th Armored Division during its attack toward Bastogne. It is a silent witness to the chaos and courage of a story that digs its roots deep into the frozen soil of history and the human spirit. This is Battle of the Bulge, Episode 15, The Beech Tree. Many of you watching this have probably seen the History Channel documentary on this battle. It is on YouTube, and I have included a link in the description. The intent here is to dig deeper into the situation and fighting that happened on December 23, 1944. We will look at the area of operations, look at the situation of the German and American forces, and review the fighting in detail. As such, let's get started with the area of operations. The area of operations consists of numerous woods and small picturesque villages which provide excellent cover and concealment. The rolling hills and open farmland facilitated long-range observation and fields of fire. Combat Command B of the 4th Armored had crossed the one major water obstacle, the Shur River. The recent weather had turned the fields into mud that could only be negotiated by tracked vehicles. Thus, while combat units could bypass the villages, they still had to be seized and the roads cleared so that food, fuel, and ammunition could be brought forward to sustain the fight. On the 23rd, the weather had changed dramatically. Light snow had fallen, and a high-pressure system had cleared the skies, allowing the Allies to bring the full power of the Air Force to the fight and to drop supplies to the besieged forces surrounded in Bastogne. <laughs> The German defenders immediately facing Combat Command B were elements of the 14th Regiment of the 5th Fallschirmjäger Division. The 2nd Battalion had two companies deployed in a series of strong points along the Chaumont Road. Its 8th Company, which was a heavy weapons company, was supposed to have 8 MG-42 machine guns and 4 80mm mortars. According to a prisoner, it had only three operational machine guns and no mortars. It consisted of only 70 to 80 men. The 7th Company held the ground on the south side of the Lambe Chenet Woods. It also had only about 70 men. It had started the campaign with just over 100 of its authorized strength of 170. However, it did have its three authorized mortars. To the west were two infantry companies from the 3rd Battalion. Inside Chaumont was the 4th Company of the 1st Battalion. This was another heavy weapons company but it had only two heavy machine guns, no mortars, and 50 men. Also in the town was the kitchen for the 1st Battalion, which contained the formidable Gulash Kanona. These troops had only about four weeks of infantry training before being thrown into the breach, and most, but not all, of their commanders were subpar. After all, these were Luftwaffe personnel who had spent most of their military career checking the oil and kicking the tires on an airplane. Because of the poor German logistics, the men were starving and had no choice but to help themselves to what sustenance they could from the civilians. They did have the support of several Sturmgeschutz III assault guns from the 3rd Battery of the 11th Assault Gun Brigade in Hollange, and artillery support was available from the 408th Folks Artillery Brigade with its 1875mm cannon. The commander of the division was holder of the Knight's Cross Colonel Ludwig Heilmann a hardened veteran who had fought on Crete in Sicily, in Russia, and commanded the regiment that defended Monte Cassino. His headquarters was co-located with the Panzer Lairs at a chateau near Losang. He would remark about the 23rd of December on two accounts. First, with the clear weather, the Allied fighter bombers were shooting up his supply columns in front of his eyes. Second, a clerk handed him a telegram from Hitler and Goering, promoting him to general. He thought to himself, 
he could use a battalion of panzers, much more than some piece of paper with a meaningless promotion. The primary German unit attacking Bastogne was the 26th Volksgrenadier Division, arguably the most capable German infantry division on the Western Front. Its leader was Colonel Heinz Kokot. On the 23rd, he monitored reports of his attack on the western side of Bastogne, and initial results looked promising. He would play a key role in the German counterattack later that day. As we saw in the last episode, the 4th Armored Division had seized two crossings over the Schur River, one at Bernan and the other at Martelange. Combat Command A and Combat Command R were attacking toward Warnock and Flatsperhof, respectively. To the west of Combat Command B were scattered remnants of the 28th Infantry Division and the 25th Cavalry Squadron. Combat Command B's mission was to attack and link up with the forces in Bastogne. Patton had ordered all units to attack day and night. Note that night attacks were not part of American armor doctrine at the time. Brigadier General Holmes Dager was the commander of CCB. He had two top-notch commanders leading the forces up front. Major Harold Cohen commanded the 10th Armored Infantry Battalion. He enlisted in the Army in 1941 at the age of 25 and, based on the advice of his drill sergeants, went to officer candidate school. The 8th Tank Battalion commander was Major Albin Erzik. He earned his commission through ROTC at the University of Massachusetts. As per the usual protocol in a combat command, the armor battalion commander was the primary leader on the ground, so Cohen was subordinate to Erzik. The infantry battalion was just over half strength, and the tank battalion fared no better. A full-strength tank company should have 18 tanks. Well, Abel Company had six Shermans, Baker 9, Charlie 7, and Dog Company a dozen of the light M3 Stuarts. The great advantage the Americans had was artillery in the number of guns, rounds available, and in tactics. In direct support of Combat Command B was the 22nd Armored Field Artillery Battalion with 18 self-propelled 105mm guns, the M7 Priest. In general support were several battalions of 105, 155, and even 8-inch guns. Major Erzik approached the mission by creating an advance guard that would be a combined arms force. The scout platoon in jeeps, led by Lieutenant James Bennett, followed by a platoon of Stuarts, and then a platoon of Shermans. Just after sunrise at 0830 hours, this lead element ran into a German ambush. Lieutenant Bennett was killed, and several tanks were knocked out. Pounded from three sides, the advance guard withdrew in disorder. By 9.30, Erzik realized he needed to reorganize the force for a deliberate attack. At 1100 hours, Major Erzik called an orders group around his tank. Normally, an American commander in his role would issue orders over the radio, but the circumstances dictated he gather his subordinates and issue the orders in person. His scheme of maneuver involved the following. A team would occupy the high ground southwest of Chaumon to provide fire support and secure the left flank. Another team would secure the area to the west of the town. A small force would provide support on this hill to the south. The main effort would attack along the main road and seize the town. The infantrymen were to leave their half-tracks behind and ride on the tanks, six or seven men per tank. The supporting artillery and a flock of P-47s would rain down fire in support, starting at 1145. As the attack started, things went to hell almost immediately, with five of the seven tanks from Charlie Company getting stuck in the mud. However, the main effort made it into Shomon, and the fighting was house to house. Erzik ordered reinforcements into the town at 1600 hours, and soon Shermans reached the northern end, and the objective was secure. Major Erzik would later remark, We got to the far end of Shomon, and we felt the town was ours. The feeling would not last as a disaster was about to strike. Just after noon in the village of Hompre, Colonel Cocott was monitoring his unit's attack when he became aware of groups of paratroopers streaming to the rear. Alarmed at what he saw, he questioned one of the group who let him know that the Americans were breaking through at Shomon. As he tried to understand what was happening, at least six P-47s that had escorted the resupply mission to Bastogne pounced on a supply column of trucks and horse-drawn carts moving through the town. 
With the smell of burning horse flesh still strong in his nostrils, Kokot began assembling a defense force. Stragglers, some trainees from the division school, some understrength infantry companies from his division, and an artillery liaison team. As the force prepared to move south, to Kokot's amazement, a force of four Tiger tanks clanked into town, and he ordered them to join in the counterattack. Wait a minute. Tigers? Where did they come from? This is an interesting mystery, and many historians have concluded that these were Jag Tigers from the 653rd Heavy Tank Hunter Battalion. My primary source for concluding it was Tiger Tanks is from the footnotes of the excellent book by Leo Barron. In his narrative, he calls them Tiger Ones, but it seems just as likely they were Tiger Twos, the so-called King Tiger. First of all, we can dismiss the Jag Tiger assertion as the 653rd's report for December 1944 mentions nothing about operations in the Ardennes. Second, Kokot called them Tiger Tanks. As a veteran combat leader on the Eastern Front, he probably would have known. Then, we have the unit diary of the 506th Heavy Panzer Battalion, which reported that it had assembled 15 to 20 Tigers in the vicinity of Eschdorf on the 22nd. The 506th had one company of Tiger Ones and three companies of Tiger Twos, and I have seen no information on what tank supported the attack on Shoman. If you have any information or thoughts on this, please provide your feedback. This next portion is going to be a little different. I went to work and took the 1943 military topographical map, cropped it down into a two kilometer by two kilometer area, and then uploaded it to the tactical warfare game combat mission. So I put that map into the game's map editor, then spent several hours recreating the actual terrain into the simulation. So this is the result. To my left is the beech tree. To my 12 year six is uh, Bernon. This is Chaumont. You have the woods here where the 8th Company of the 14th Fallschirmjäger Regiment was located. And then over here, the Lambation Name Woods. All right, so let's see how this goes. As the sun set, the Germans struck, taking Combat Command B by surprise. The Shermans caught in the open were ripped apart by the fire of the Tiger tanks and a few assault guns. Chaos ensued as the exhausted GIs, which had been attacking nonstop for over 24 hours, fell back to the south. Ursik was just south of town, his tank climbing the hill in reverse toward the beech tree when it was hit. He described it as if the vehicle had been hit by a huge sledgehammer throwing the three crewmen in the turret to the floor. He hollered into the microphone for the driver to keep moving. In a bit of luck, the round had only grazed the turret, cracking it open. Reaching a concealed position, Erzik would look down and see the mitten on his right hand was soggy with blood. As night fell, the battle ended, and an already depleted Combat Command B tried to recover from a severe beating. It had lost 11 Shermans, one Stuart, and one M18 Hellcat tank destroyer. As for the infantry, Able Company suffered only five casualties, but Baker suffered 65. Combat Command B of the 4th Armored Division would be out of the fight for the 24th. The 10th Armored Infantry Battalion was so short of infantrymen that the 80th Infantry Division transferred one of its battalions to support the command. It wasn't until late on Christmas Day that the Americans regained a tenuous hold on Shomon, due in large part to the heroic effort of Private Wiedorfer who eliminated two machine gun positions that unhinged the German defense. In the big picture, the defenders of Bastogne were in a desperate situation. Despite the supply drop and air support, the men were running short of ammunition, especially artillery rounds. The other two combat commands of the 4th Armored Division were struggling to advance, fighting from one village to the next. On Christmas night, Troy Middleton radioed General Anthony McAuliffe and told him that the 3rd Army would have to wait at least another 24 hours to reach him. A disheartened McAuliffe would remark after the call, we have been let down. Before you punch out, there is one last thing. Why climb the highest mountain? Why 35 years ago fly the Atlantic? Why does Rice play Texas? We choose to like and subscribe. We choose to like and subscribe.
we choose to like and subscribe and leave comments below and do the other things. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills.